Now, at this point, you're probably thinking, ooh, that definition, that seems a little complicated. Well, that's what it might seem like, but in reality, well, it really is kind of complicated, but let's think our way through it. One of the difficulties is that we're integrating over all of Rn. How do we integrate over a bounded region? Well, this is not so bad. Given a nice domain, fill it up with cubes, and then just sample the points in those cubes. Add up all those values, and then decrease the grid size so that you have a, a lot more cubes that are filling up that domain. And then you keep going, you do that again, and eventually, eventually, you're converging to that region of integration, and hopefully your Riemann sums converge as well. That's the idea. Let's take a moment and think a little bit about the notation associated to integrals in higher dimensions. Let's say we have an integrand f defined over some region r in n-dimensional space. Then the integral is denoted the integral over r of f d x. That's a nice compact way to write it. I'm using the x with the underline to denote the fact that we're in the volume form in n-dimensional space. If I have explicit coordinates, x1, x2, all the way up through xn, then I can expand this integral out into a, a slightly different notation where I take n integral signs and stack them together, and then my volume form, instead of dx with the underline, could be written out as dx1, dx2, etc., etc., all the way up through dx. N. This connotes the fact that my infinitesimal volume element is like a, a, a little rectangular prism with dimensions dx1, dx2, all the way up through dxn. Now, there are some special cases if n equals 2 or 3, then these are often called double integrals or triple integrals, respectively. In the case where n equals 1 and our domain of integration is connected, say an interval from a to b, then the old notation that we used for this definite integral had those limits expressed as a subscript and superscript respectively. We're going to need the more general notation for more general domains. Now, we haven't talked so much about why we care about doing higher dimensional integrals, but there are lots of real world problems that require integrals in dimensions higher than one. One great example of applications comes from electromagnetics, where you use double or triple integrals to compute, say, net charge based on a charge density. We're not going to do anything with electromagnetics in this volume, but in the next volume, we're going to talk about things like this, things like flux of an electric field or a magnetic field, all sorts of cool stuff there. But that comes a little bit later. In this volume, we are going to spend some time talking about mechanics, looking at the physics of motion of a solid body. That's going to take us to places where we're computing centers of mass, moments of inertia, angular momentum, things like that. Those are all going to be double and triple integrals. But in higher dimensions still, our principal motivation is going to come from probability, where we look at multiple random variables, and all of the basic statistical measures that we care about, things like mean, things like variance, standard deviation, these are all going to be expressed in terms of integrals, not just in 2D or 3D, but in higher dimensions as well. But first, we're going to focus on computations, then applications later.